So this talk is called The Anatomy of an Exploit. And the idea, uh, what I hope that you will get through this presentation is an idea of how, how exploit developers think, how they uh, work, and realize that it's not that dissimilar from a programming job. It's just against a really crappy machine. Hopefully you'll understand what that means by the end of the talk. Um, so my name is Patricia Oz. You might have already learned that from the keynote. But um, yes, I am a professional trainer and consultant. Uh, so hire me. I do things. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm a C++ uh, programmer. Uh, in my own company, uh, we specialize in programming meets application security. Um, so if that's something that's interesting, then reach out. Um, before that, I worked uh, on a couple of uh, browsers. My first job was at Opera Software, where I worked on the original Opera browser, um, on Linux uh, desktop browser, so many of you maybe have used things I've made. Uh, then I, I tried to be like a Java consultant for a couple of years, but it didn't stick. And then I went back to C++ in Embedded and uh, worked at Cisco for five years. And then I was uh, wanted to make browser again, so I went to Vivaldi. <laughs> and then last year I started off on my own. Um, yeah. So first i want to to present you a, a mental model and then we'll get back to this mental model in the end um so that is the model of the weird machine this this model was uh, was developed by two mathematicians turned uh, exploit developers uh, and they've refined it over several years of thinking about it and writing papers and and the goal they had was to try to to lend some formalism to exploit development uh, especially coming from an academic background that is, is hard because exploit development has mostly been um, knowledge sharing, but very informal, a lot of myth, a lot of, of things. It's difficult to learn as a discipline because there's not like necessarily a lot of books. Uh, fortunately, some books have been written, but it doesn't really explain the, the, the formalistic model. Um, so they made uh, a model, and it goes something like this. So the idea is that you have uh, some kind of program, a target program. So this is the program that you want to exploit. The idea is that the program is really a, a finite state machine. And the states here are basically the states imagined by the programmer. So if something happens, then I will do something. Or if something else happens, I will do this other thing. And you basically, in your head, as a programmer, have an idea of at least parts of this finite state machine. And you have inten intended transitions. So if I get this from the user, I should do this thing. So the concept in this model of a vulnerability is when you have an unintended transition. So in a C++ program, that could be a, a null pointer dereference or an access outside of array bounds, an integer, assigned integer overflow, any kind of thing that would cause maybe the program to crash or have memory corruption. Now, in this model, this in introduces what they call a weird state. So instead of all your intended states in your normal uh, model, you now have, you are in a weird state. Now, one of the characteristics of a weird state is that it is unstable. Usually, it will cause the program to crash. Uh, not, maybe not immediately, but at some point in the future. Um, so one of the things that you need to do as an exploit developer is try to, to exploit the weird state by trying to stabilize it, because you don't really want the program to crash. Although that, that sometimes is a goal. Like, uh, and, the, and then you, they call it a denial of service attack on a specific program is just to make it crash. And sometimes that could be useful. Uh, but most of the time, you want to go further than that. And what you then need is to make a transition to another unintended state. So now you're in a state machine which kind of exists next to the program. A state machine that was never intended by the programmer. And to make transitions from one weird state to another weird state, you have to exploit 
the transitions in the program itself. So when the program would do a transition, let's say to use, uh, use a pointer to a deleted object, object, if you can now control the memory that that pointer points to, when that pointer is dereferenced, then that is, that is a transition in the normal program that you are using in your now weird state machine. And so, and you can take this all the way to maybe being able to execute some shell code, and now you're getting to more normal programming. And so we will look at all of this. Okay, so the thing that makes it weird to think about as a programmer is that in exploit development, very often the data that is read in to memory by the program, that is where your program is. And it, can ha and it could look very strange. Uh, like if you have a format string bug, basically what you're feeding into the program is the format string to a printf or a similar function. That is your program. Your program is percent %d, percent %p, percent %n, things like that. It doesn't look like a programming language. Uh, and also the program is fixed. You can't you normally change it. It's compiled. It's a binary. You just have it. There's no way to change the program itself. Uh, although we will look a little bit about how you could do that if the program isn't signed. So what ends up being your data structures is usually things you don't think about much as a programmer. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that exploit development is programming. Uh, but it is programming of a really, really messed up machine. <laughs> Uh, and, and we will see all the weird things uh, you could do today. So we'll start off simple. Uh, so uh, there is a CWE. If you, it, like I, I do a training, which this is inspired by, by the way. So if the, you find this interesting, you can, uh, you can hire me. CWE is a common uh, uh, weakness enumeration. And it is uh, a way of trying to catalog uh, vulnerabilities, and you can look at it. And one of them is called inherently dangerous function. Uh, and it is around the function gets. Now, what you will see today is that hardly anybody uses gets, and you will very quickly see why. Um, so this is the program that we'll be looking at today all of like this talk. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, stolen with permission from Olva. <laughs> and basically because it's kind of fun and it fits on a slide. <laughs> uh, so going through it very quickly uh, is on the bottom you have uh, a main and it prints war games, missile launcher, version 0 0.1. And then it calls authenticate and launch, uh, which is the function above. Uh, and uh, then it writes operation complete. So the, the meat of the, of the program is the authenticate and launch, uh, which has some local variables, uh, including a stack allocated buffer. And then it will print out, out this secret and then try to read in the response into the stack allocated buffer. And then it will compare what's in this buffer. And if it is Joshua, now this is from like the movie War Games, so if you've seen it, it kind of makes sense. If you haven't seen it, it doesn't really matter, <laughs> but you should see it. <laughs> Okay, um, but anyway, so if the, if the response is Joshua, then you say allow access is true, and if allow access is true, then you launch missiles. And the, the number of missiles you launch is hard-coded in the program, so it's n missiles and it's two. So if you type Joshua, it will launch two missiles. If not, it will say access denied and exit. So it doesn't do anything more than this. Uh, so for this section, this is the important part. So we are using gets to read into the stack allocated buffer. Uh, and gets, even compiling this program isn't really easy uh, because gets was deprecated uh, a long time ago, it was specifically for this reason. Uh, and if you try to compile it, you'd not only get a warning, you get this one. It's like, warning, the gets function is dangerous and should not be used. Now, if you continue to use it after this, I feel like you kind of set yourself up uh, 
for, for that experience. Uh, and so, but, but you know, uh, we can get past this. Uh, all we do is tell uh, CMake that, you know what, <laughs> we don't care. Um, we don't care if you deprecated it and we're going to use C99. So there you go. Uh, so now it compiles at least, so let's try to run it. Uh, so here is our program and we enter David and we get access denied. An operation complete. Okay, so let's try Joshua and we get access granted launching two missiles. So this is awesome. So then let's try an unhappy scenario. Let's try to, to uh, maybe write, I don't know, global thermal nuclear war maybe. Now, uh, like a, a little bit of an aside, I, I was working on the, the programs for this uh, on a plane. And that's <laughs> awkward. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it was awkward. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, but anyway, uh <laughs> So here, if we do this, uh, we get buffer overflow detected and launch terminated, which really ruined our like lead hacker uh, thing of writing in a string, right? So, so that was unfortunate. But what we do see is that we did enter an unstable weird state. So, so we are getting to something. We have already exited the normal uh, flow of the program, and we've gotten to the point where we can see there is a weird state here that we can provoke by writing in a string. Okay, but this problem is unfortunately because libc on my machine has fortify protection, which really ruined all my lead hacker things, so, but we can turn that off. Um, <laughs> so, so this is how you would turn that off. Um, I don't recommend that either, but you know, it's, it's fun. Okay, so we turn that off and then we try again. And we get access denied, stack smashing detected. Okay, so we get another different thing, but currently it it's keeps on like thwarting our efforts here. Uh, so that was unfortunate. Um, so what is going on? Uh, any guesses? Yeah, it's a stack canary. Uh, so what does that look like? Well, this is this is a is a visualization of our uh, our stack. Stacks are kind of weird on x86 uh, because it grows towards lower addresses. Uh, and if you were in in uh, in the previous talk, then <laughs> they got into that. Uh, but but the problem is that you always get people like saying weird things, like like yeah, and then the stack grows up and they point down, and it's just very hard to visualize. But basically, <laughs> you subtract things when it grows. Okay, and this is important because um, when you write to any kind of memory, uh, you, grow, you write to higher addresses, right? So when you write to a stack al allocated buffer, you're actually writing, and notice the pointing here, you're writing down the stack, <laughs> right? Um, so, so this was an issue. Uh, you had a lot of uh, stack buffer overflow exploits, uh, which what they were trying to do is that they were overwriting a stack allocated array and then trying to, to overwrite this return address on the stack. And so when this function returns, it would jump to whatever is in the return address. Um, and, and that was like a good start to get off and running. Unfortunately, uh, an innovation was, uh, was made to introduce what they call a stack canary um, or stack protection. And so you would insert some kind of random value here and before the compiler, uh, and in the compiled code, before it will do a ret, sorry, uh, it would check if the stack canary is still intact. And if it was still intact, you would do the ret. If it wasn't still intact, you would abort. In the beginning, this wasn't on always, so if you have an older compiler, it, it might be off. Uh, but in, in newer compilers, it's always on. But it doesn't always introduce a stack canary. It only does it if there is something that could overflow in this function. Uh, the problem is this is, this is ruining our fun. <laughs> so, but you can turn it off. Uh, so, you know, that's how you do that. Okay, so let's try again. So we turned off the stack protector. Let's see what happens. 
Okay, so we get access denied, now we get segmentation fault. It's really, it's really not our day. Uh, okay, so let's go and try to check on Godbolt. What is going on here? And if we look on Godbolt uh, in debug, these two uh, local variables, missiles and allow access, are stack allocated. But when you look in release, they're gone. And of course, it makes sense when you, you've seen, hopefully, throughout this conference, how fabulous compilers are getting. And basically, there's really no reason to keep them around. And missiles is a constant, so you can just inline it and allow access with a little bit of a fiddling of the logic. You basically don't need it either. And so they both disappear. So overwriting them on the stack is not possible because they're gone. There's no variable. OK. So, but let's try the debug build and see if our, our theory holds, like if we can overwrite these local variables on the stack at least. Um, so we do it again. Ooh, we got access granted. Okay, so, so we've at least gotten a little bit out of our weird state. We managed to actually do something. We got access granted and we're <laughs> launching a couple of missiles. <laughs> okay. So, so promising? Uh, okay, so we got access granted and access denied, so uh, that was weird. Uh, it's a sort of win, I guess, but somebody's bulls are acting weird because they're both true and false at the same time. Um, but of course, now we're in undefined behavior land and that's fine there. <laughs> um, okay, but... Patricia says in her training, prefer C++ to C, so let's make it C++, because it must be better, right? Okay, so take away all of our weirdness, all of the things we tur turned off, let's bring it back to normal, and we'll just like call it launch underscore CPP, and just change uh, the, suff the, the extension to CPP, and, and let's try again. Okay, so let's try to build this. Uh, but also we have to make it CPP, so, so what we do is we change this one line. And now it's C++. Um, you can see that right there. <laughs> right? That's, that's how we do that. Uh, much better. <laughs> okay, so let's try to build it. Okay. And yeah. Okay. It's not even a warning. Okay, so basically this must be better, right? It's not even a warning here. I didn't have to turn anything off to do this. It's, it, this must be fabulous. Okay, so let's try the happy day scenario to make sure it works the way it used to. And this looks good. Okay, let's try the release build and then do our fabulous exploit, which is the string global thermonuclear war. And we get access denied, operation complete, segmentation fault. Okay, that wasn't really what we were going for. Okay, so let's try debug build. Same string, access granted, launching a bazillion missiles and segmentation fault. But at least we got to launch the missiles, so we're happy, right? It's not that important. And this is also something that's important to understand with exploits. Is it not, it's not necessarily important the quality of the work as long as you manage to, to, to achieve the goal. So if the, achieve, the goal was to launch basically all of the missiles, then it doesn't really matter <laughs> if the program crashes afterwards. Sometimes it matters if you don't want anybody to notice, but if it doesn't matter, it's like, who cares? You managed. But it wasn't exactly what we were going for because here you can, okay, one of the two other things that is important to understand here is that both end missiles and allow access are being overwritten, but we are also crashing. And, okay, so let's see if we can do something about that. Because we know we can control the stack variables. Uh, but can we do that without crashing? So these are the ones that we, we know we can control by overwriting this buffer. Um, so let's see how, right? How are they being used? 
Okay, so let's let's give it a shot. If we can override these, overwrite these, but still not hit the stack canary, then we are able to control this program. So let's try a shorter string so we don't write as far on the stack. Okay, so uh, we try again. And now we just like try like A, A, B, B, C, C. It's easier to see in a hex editor if you like have a, like a string with repeating patterns. <laughs> Uh, uh, like in, in the hacking community, they really love lots of A's, whereas I think B's are better because B is 42 in ASCII and hex. <laughs> but for some reason, they love their 41's. Um, anyway, so, but we get access granted, launching 42 missiles, which is the best number, and operation complete, and no crash. Okay, so we know now that we can overwrite two stack variables and not crash. But can we control the values of those two in a predictable way? Well, you could have probably guessed since it's 42 that, you know, we can. Um, because NMS cells is 42 and 42 is 0x2a zero x, zero x in hex, which is the star. So you might guess that the orange star up there is the one that's giving us the 42. Um, meaning that we can put in something else and get a different number. Okay, so now we know that this string, just changing the last character, we can change what the value of, of, uh, of the number of missiles is. Okay, so that's good. But can we control allow access? Is there a way to, oh, okay. So if we change that character, then we got access denied. And basically any other character in that position is access granted. So awesome. So basically now we have a way to control both allow access and the number of missiles and not crash. But to be cool, we need to like automate this, like make it like a little bit cooler than having to type in the terminal. It's, it doesn't look cool. Um, so then we're going to write a little C program that is going to do this for us. Like it's actually just going to do exactly what we did before. Uh, it's, uh, but, uh, but here it's just using, making, using C to make the little struct of what is on the stack. Then, then actually setting the values there and then writing that to standard out. And if we have that writing to standard out, um, then we can pipe it straight into our program. And that looks pretty cool. Like now we're piping our exploit into our, our, uh, our program and then now it looks like we know what we're doing, right? So let's try it. Access granted, launching 42 missiles, operation complete. Whoo! Okay, let's try it with the C++ program, which was so much better, right? Um, hey, it works. It works on both C++ and C with the exact same exploit. So this is awesome. Hmm, we should fix that C++ code, right? It's not okay that the C++ code was just as vulnerable as the C code and we didn't even get a warning. So at least we should like go and fix it, right? Um, so there are many ways you can fix it, but let's just say, see here that you can actually set the width that is allowed to be read in. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of people do this, but it's possible. Um, so let's test that. Well, that's unfortunate, right? That now it's like we fixed the program, so what are we going to do now? That was like, we're on slide 43. Okay, so let's do something else. Let's break it again. Um, so now let's do a binary patch, because that's also cool. Like, how hard can it be? So let's go and look at, at uh, the binary. And it turns out that this little, this little byte here sets the number of missiles. This little byte here says whether allow access is true or false. So if we just overwrite one byte and another byte, so that's two bytes in the program, then suddenly 
we're always good. <laughs> no matter what you write in, <laughs> you will always launch all of the missiles. <laughs> okay. But that wasn't as cool. We want something cooler. Uh, okay, so let's try and see if we can make like a stack buffer overflow exploit, right? Um, so the, the goal here is that you have some sort of target process which has in it some kind of vulnerable program. So this model goes uh, for Linux, but it's similar on other platforms as well. Um, so on Linux, you have a target process, and in memory, it has some kind of, of program. Uh, there's also a system call called execve, which uh, will replace the program in the running process. Uh, so in this case, if we do execve with bin sh, then we will replace the program in the running process with a shell. Okay, so this is what we want to do. And, and if anyone has heard the term shell code, this is where that comes from. It's basically a little bit of code that will give us shell like a pound, like a terminal prompt. Uh, currently, they use the term shellcode much bro more broadly. It could be like anything. It could be uh, on Windows, a typical thing would be to start up the calculator just to show that you have, have the, the possibility of executing code natively. Uh, but we're going to be old school, so we're going for shellcode, a code that gives you shell. So the right direction, um, is, well, the stack grows downward, and the right direction when we write goes up, like we saw before. Um, but execution also goes towards positive addresses. Um, and that's kind of important, uh, because what we want to do is we want to overwrite our buffer, and then we want to write an address on the return, which points back into our buffer. So that when this function returns from where we over are overwriting the buffer, then it will jump into the code that we just wrote on the stack. And then when execution jumps to that address, it will just execute inside of our buffer. So that is the goal. That is the theory. Um, so this is just like the boilerplate we're going to put everything in. It's not very fancy or very cool, but it fits on a slide. Um, so we need, we need a couple of things here. First of all, all the way on the top, I wonder if this works. Yay, up there, it's the shell code. So we need some sort of shell code. We haven't gotten that far. Um, then we need uh, some way to find the offset. Because if we go back here, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Um, we need to, to find out how far away from here is the return address. So how far do we have to write before we get here where we have to write an address? Um, and so this is uh, the first part uh, that we need uh, to figure out. Uh, but we also then need to write the shellcode uh, and the padding to fill out the space between our shellcode and the return address, where we're actually going to overwrite. Uh, but we also need the address of the buffer in memory to know what to write on the return address, right? So to make it a little bit simpler for the presentation, we're cheating a little bit. Oh, sorry, here. So here we have, uh, we've increased the, the size of the response buffer a little bit, and we're also printing the address of the response buffer. Normally, you would use some sort of, of, um, of information leak to get these addresses, uh, but there's only so much you can cram into a presentation, so we'll just have to live with it. Um, but we have a problem, because every time we run our program, all of the addresses changes. Uh, and they change because of something called address-based layout randomization, which is another mitigation against these types of attacks by basically making stable, uh, and by removing stable addresses. So things will be loaded in different parts of memory each time you run the process. So hard coding addresses in memory is not no longer possible. So that's unfortunate, uh, but you can turn that off. <laughs> 
So we do that. Okay, so now, uh, now we need to figure out like how far from the beginning of our buffer is, is this return address. Uh, and you can do that by like trying and failing like a ton of times, but here is a much easier way to do it. So there's a, a, a framework that is used a lot by penetration testers and also by hackers of all kinds, and it's called Metasploit. And basically, whenever there's a new vulnerability anywhere, then somebody will write a module for Metasploit, and now it's scriptable, and, and you don't really have to understand how it works. <laughs> it's great. Um, but it uh, has two very simple, um, simple scripts, which I really like. Uh, one is called Pattern Create, and one is called Pattern Offset. And they're very simple. Uh, they're used to find exactly what we need, how far away is the return from the beginning of this buffer. That's what they do. Uh, so you do pattern create, and it will create a non-repeating uh, character sequence so that you can feed it in and overwrite your buffer. Uh, and then it gives you an offset, so you can feed it in a little bit of a string, and it will tell you how far that little bit of string is from the beginning of the random string. So I'll show you how that works. So you do pattern create, and here we we're creating a pattern which is 150 characters long. And then uh, we're running our program. Now, one thing to point out here is another thing we're turning off. Anybody know what this is? Minus Z XX stack? Yeah. We're making the stack executable because that's another mitigation that is in modern operating systems today. And the reason why I'm pointing out many of these things is that a lot of people are stuck on, law, on old Linux distributions, for example, in embedded, not really realizing that there are many mitigations, security mitigations in newer, newer versions of all of the operating systems. Uh, older versions of Windows didn't have any of these mitigations either which makes make them really popular targets because they're much easier to exploit. Uh, but anyway, we turn that off because, you know, it ruins the fun. Um, and we try again. So we're running it in GDB. And the first thing we do is that we set a breakpoint on the return, on the ret instruction. Because what we want to do is, because when the ret instruction is executed, it will pop off the address on top of the stack and jump to it, jump execution to that address. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out what is in, what is on top of the stack when ret happens. So we set the breakpoint, um, we launch the program, and then we feed in our string. Uh, so that's the string up there. In, the, in white, you can see that it's printing up, out the address of the buffer, but that's just because we're cheating here. Um, it doesn't really matter that it's launching missiles because what we're trying to do is figure out what is on top of the stack. So we just print that. Okay, so that's, that's what's the return right now. Okay, that's all we need because then we can feed that into pattern offset. And it tells us, okay, so there's an exact match for this 136 characters into our string. Okay, so now we know how far we need to go. So 136. That's the address of the buffer, and that's the offset. So then we can feed that into the, 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 the program we saw before. But we still need a shellcode. We, we didn't have a shellcode. We need something to actually do the thing. Now, I went through uh, the classic example of uh, writing shellcode in uh, my CppCon talk last year, and that's this one. But we'll do other ones today. But first, we're going to try this one. So this is the one uh, I made in the previous talk, uh, and so we're just going to try it. Now, if you, if one thing that's good to see here is that shellcode is basically just characters in, in a car buffer, basically. And this, this structure here that you see here is how you often demonstrate shellcode. So you have some sort of little main, and that, that just executes this character buffer to make sure that it does what it's supposed to. Um, of course, to do that, you need an uh, executable uh, stack and everything, So, but we're just testing to see that it works, that our little character buffer does what it's supposed to do, and yes, it gives us a shell prompt, so it actually managed to do exec VE 
on a slash bin slash sh. Okay, so that's good. It's a good start. So we have the character buffer we need for our shell code. So then we can put together all of the pieces we've had so far um, and see if it works. So now we are here, we're writing the exploit into the file instead of piping it because now we, we can test it in GDB and it's easier to debug. So we write the exploit itself into a file, then we start off GDB with our program, and then we, we feed the exploit output into our program, and then we see what happens. And it just hangs. It doesn't really do anything, it just hangs. Uh, it turns out it's because the string inside of, uh, of our shell code is not uh, zero terminated, and so when it tries to read it, it just continues to read on the stack and it just nothing happens. Okay, so that was unfortunate. So our shell code didn't really work. Okay, that sucks. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, let's try and look at that part of the shell code. So let's do it in a different way. Let's actually just write the string and and uh, and zero terminated. So basically, here we have um, zeroed out rex here with the xor, and so we push rex to the stack. So now we have a null terminator. Uh, then we take the string, and it doesn't really look like the string, but if you look up here, this hex this hex value is this in ASCII, which is this the other way around. Okay, so this value here is our is slash bin slash sh in a non-readable form. So we move that into rbx and then we push rbx onto the stack and now we have a string on the stack which is null terminated. Okay, so we're good. Okay, so let's try that and see if that works. Okay, it gives us a shell prompt, so it looks promising. Okay, so we put it back into the exploit that we had before and actually try to feed it to our program and see what happens. And it looks promising, like right here. It says like process something something is executing a new program slash bin dash. And slash bin dash is because on my system slash bin slash sh is a symlink to slash bin dash. Uh, but right after, it just says it exited normally, which sucks, because where's my shell prompt? This is not like, this is not what I was going for. Okay, so fine. Let's go and have a look. What's going on here? It kind of did kind of something that it like, it, it like, it looked promising because it started it, right? But then it exited and that really sucks. So let's look at strace, try to figure out if it's actually trying to start my program and what happens after. Maybe we can find some errors in the system calls. Um, and so we write all of, all of, the, all of the system call, the strace log to a file, which you can see here. Uh, and then we run through again and we have a look at the log. Uh, and what we find in the log is that there is some enotttty inappropriate ioctl for device. Okay, so something is wrong with ttty. We don't really know what's wrong because it's really hard to debug at this point. And so we're like, okay, so it just kind of, I don't know. Okay, let's Google. That's what we do, right? Okay, let's go Google. And then we find some stuff and we're digging through things and we're like, okay, so it looks like maybe the fact that we are already l reading from the terminal is messing up the fact of starting up a new terminal because the new terminal also needs to read from standard in and so the whole thing kind of get messed up and we're kind of vague on the idea, but let's try another idea. Okay, so we'll do attempt number three. We're gonna try to close standard in and then reopen TT2Y just to see if it works. Okay, so now we're going to follow and this is the same, uh, same methodology I explained in my uh, my talk at CppCon. We're going to write C code for the shell code. We're going to compile it. We're going to write inline assembly, basically inspired by our compiled program. And then we're going to put those characters in a car buffer, and then we're going to try to execute it. Okay, 
So let's see what the C code looks like. Basically, we are going to close the zero file descriptor, open TTY. Then this is our 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 uh, our argv, and this is argv zero here, and we put argv here, and this is env, and we can pass null for that. Okay, so this is the smallest program, and we hope it, it's going to work, but it's easy to test because we can just compile it and run it and see, right? So we build it statically, and, and here I'm also taking away the stack protector, but that's basically because it's just noise. Um, but we're building it statically because we want to make sure that we have all of the code in this one binary so we can have a look at what it looks like. Um, and when we run it, we get the shell prompt because the code works. Uh, and if we do LDD on it, it's a static binary. Okay, so that works. So let's go and look at the, the assembly. So we do object dump on our binary, and we have a little bit of a look. And okay, there looks like there are some, some calls here. They're not necessarily obvious that, th that, like first of all, like underscore underscore close would be called for close. Okay, that makes sense. But it wasn't necessarily obvious that it was under underscore libc underscore open that would be called for open. But execve also looks normal. So what we're trying to figure out here is what are the system calls involved because now we have to write the assembly. And so we're using the existing assembly for, that we've compiled now as inspiration for writing our new assembly. And, and then we go and Google the syscalls involved and that's uh, sysclose, sysexecve, and sysopenat. And we figure out uh, what the calling convention for these are. So if you were in in uh, the previous talk by uh, Knappen. Um, then he talked a little bit about calling conventions. And the calling convention on Linux 64-bit looks like this for these functions. So here it just basically says, if you're calling this system call over here, then you have to put the file descriptor in RDI. If you call execve, then you have a file name pointer that goes into RDI, the pointer to argv goes in RSI, and blah, 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 and so on. So what we need to do is actually, before we do the system call, we have to set up all of the right values and all of the right registers. And once we do that, we just call syscall, and it will just go and pick up all of the, all of the parameters in the right registers, and that's basically how we are going to do this. Uh, over here, you have the system call number. So for close, it's 3. Uh, for execv, it's 59, which is 3b in hex. And for open, it is 257, which is 101 in hex. OK, so based on this, we're going to go and look more at the code. So here we can see that it's moving uh, hex 3 into EAX and then calls syscall. OK, so we know we're going to need at least this. Uh, and also, we also need this unsigned uh, int file descriptor in RDI. But we're closing zero, right? So it doesn't really matter. All we have to make sure that it is, there's a zero in RDI, so, which makes this the easiest one, because all we need to do is put three in EIX and zero in RDI and just call syscall. OK, so if we look at it, it's basically this. We zero out RDI, we zero out RAX, and then we put three in AL, and we call syscall. Uh, this is. Uh, this is inline assembly in, in uh, AT&T syntax, which is like not what you had in the previous talk. <laughs> um, AT&T syntax is basically the default output of all Linux tools, but you can also set it to, to Intel, and most people like Intel better, and if you want friends, you probably want to do Intel. <laughs> I, I'm not too concerned with the friends part, so I'm doing AT&T. Um, but anyway, so moving on. So then we need to do open at. And open at is much more complicated. It is like super much more complicated. It has a lot of more uh, parameters that we need to set. Uh, but first of all, we just need to look at the syscall number, which is down here. So here we have 101 moved into EAX. OK, and then there's like lots of stuff. And I'm not sure I want to do all of this stuff. It's probably like really super professional stuff, but I don't want to have all of this stuff. So let's see what I can get away with. 
Okay, so we just like try. Okay, I don't want to put stuff in here. So can I get away with zero for mode and zero for flags? And I don't know, this, I, it's like it's trying and failing on different things. So I'm just trying to set things to zero and see if I can get away with it. So here I'm setting RDX, this one, to zero. I'm setting, if you, if you want this, I'm using XOR over here. Because when you use XOR uh, in the generated, well, we'll see it in a second. But in the, there's, there's no zero bytes in, in the hex code for XOR. Uh, and move uh, can introduce zero bytes, which we will see in a second. But anyway, so I do XOR here to zero out all of these registers, uh, which is R10, RDX, and RDI over here. So we're trying to just set zero for all of those and hoping that works. And then we're using the same trick that we did before. Oh, no. Here. Uh, for putting in the string of the dev TTTY by just, we're lucky and it's eight bytes, so it still fits. And we do the same trick by pushing RAX and then pushing our little string. Uh, and that's our goal, right? We're going to try that. Then the next one is XXVE, but we already had some code for that already, so we're hoping we can like reuse that. Uh, so it's basically the same code that we saw before, uh, with the same same concept of of the string hard coded here. And so we put all of that together as inline assembly, and then we execute it, and we see, okay, does it work? Okay, so it works. It uh, it gives us a shell prompt, so the code works. Okay, so now we have like a we have a, a inline assembly, but we don't have a character buffer. Okay, so now we go and we look at the assembly of our inline assembly, <laughs> right? Which is basically what we've already seen. But one of the things that we see here is that the, over here you have the bytes. Now these are the ones that we're going to end up putting in our character buffer and try to execute. And unfortunately, right here we have some zero bytes. Now, zero bytes are unfortunate if you're, uh, the, 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 the function you're trying to exploit in your target program is some kind of string function. Because you are sending in a character buffer. If this is some kind of string function, it will truncate. And we don't want that. We, we need all of our things, right? So we can't have any uh, zero bytes inside of our shellcode. Now, up until here, we're looking good. But right here, we get two. And here you can see my XORs, there's no zero bytes. But here there's a move, and unfortunately, it didn't work out for us. And the problem is this 101. Uh, because for the other uh, system calls here, the, oh, we'll do this one up here. Uh, we're moving three into AL, which is, uh, which is smaller. Uh, but here we have a number that is over 256 is uh, 101. Uh, and so it's not going to fit in that one byte. And so we need more room. And so we're using a different instruction. Now, that's unfortunate for us. But maybe we can fix it. OK, so let's go and look at the code. So this is the problem. This is where we were failing in our inline assembly over here. But maybe we can do it in a different way. OK, so being a programmer, <laughs> oh, well, I have a program, right? So I can just put 255 in there and ink it twice, and then I have 257. And ink doesn't introduce zero bytes, so you know, home free. This is good, high-level, great programming. OK, so let's try that. And we put that in there and see what happens. And hey, everything's fine. All of our zero bytes are gone. And you can see it over here. It's like here, it's like 255, 256, 257, yeah, syscall. Okay, so looking at this now, we have our close code up there, our open call here, and then our execve code there. Okay, so now we can use the bytes that we can see over here um, and put them in a character buffer and then try to execute that. So that's our next step. So it looks like this. It was basically what we saw before, except what was inline assembly has now become comments. Um, and we tried to execute it. So we have the close, the open, and the execve. 
And we execute it like we did in the beginning with this little main that actually just executes this character buffer. And what we want to do is to make sure it actually works before we use it for anything else. And it gives a shell. So we've gone from having a C program to having an inline assembly program to now having executing just a character array. OK, so that works. Now let's go and see if we can do to actually use it to exploit our program, because that was the point. Um, so let's try it in GDB again. And so we write the exploit to a file. Uh, we run our, our exploit in, in GDB, and then we feed it our file, and we see what happens. OK, so far so good. Access denied. We don't care. OK, so it says ex executing new program. So this is as far as we got last time. So let's see if we're getting further this time. And yay, we got show. It's like, win. So finally, finally, we look a little bit like baby hackers. And we can do a thing. OK. But the thing is, we were like doing it in GDB and everything. And we want to do it like without GDB and with the pipe thing to make it like look cooler. OK, so let's see if it still works. Yay, it works. OK, so now we basically, we just need to buy the hoodie and we're like off running, right? Um, because it works in debug, it works in production. Ship it, right? So, but we cheated, right? And we've cheated like throughout the entire presentation. We've done so many cheats. And, and, the, and the cheating here is basically to prove a point that a lot of the mitigations that you have in your operating systems, in your compilers, in modern compilers, that are on by default, actually help. Because we turned off address-based layout randomization, we made the stack executable. We turned off stack canaries. We even printed the address of the buffer. All of this to like, be cool and do the thing. And the thing is, none of the, and like, all of these things were basically not present before. Even the printing of the address of the buffer is the buffer was at a fixed address. You could just like open the program, look at the memory, and try it. You could run it in GDB and figure out where it was in memory. This was, all of this wasn't there in the late 90s, early 2000s. And all of this was like stuff that got in our way of trying to do this thing, and we just turned it off. And the reason why I'm saying this is because if you Google like some of these error messages that you get, like number one accepted answer on Stack Overflow is how to turn it off. <laughs> right? So don't do that. But because of these, we've seen uh, the emergence of different types of uh, exploitation techniques, and hopefully I will talk about that in a future talk, but uh, one of them is information leaks. And that's the problem is that because of address-based layout randomization, you don't really know where anything is in memory, and so you need uh, to, to get some kind of addresses out of the program in different ways. And so any way to leak addresses from the program so that you know where things are uh, goes under information leaks. And most attacks today start with at least some information leaks. Then you also had something called return-oriented programming, which became very popular because you couldn't execute code on the stack anymore, which was unfortunate. But the great thing is that there was a lot of executable code all over memory, like your program and libraries. And suddenly, maybe you can use the existing code that is already there to just jump to the specific pieces that you're interested in. And maybe actually you can stitch together a program through micro pieces of existing program in memory. And a very interesting technique was created. And it sounds really complicated, but what they did was in the end, they just made a Python, Python program, which took your program as an input, what you wanted to do as another input, and generated these addresses for you. <laughs> so <laughs> you basically had a a uh, compiler for your program that basically just generated all of these little gadgets. They're very good at making scripts. <laughs> but back to our drawing. 
because now maybe it makes more sense. We have one vulnerability in our program. That is the stack buffer overflow. We're, over, we're writing past the end of a stack allocated array. And that is our vulnerability. Now what can we do with that? Can we stabilize it? Can we move to another state? Can we somehow get from here by using the return of a function to get to another state where we might be able to launch our shellcode? And the reason why this model is interesting is because it actually applies to many different exploitation techniques because they basically all are around this concept of breaking out of the mental model of the programmer and making this program do something it was never meant to do. So our programs, they need to be deterministically correct. We aim for that, right? <laughs> we aim to be not accidentally correct, but we try to be deterministically correct in general. Um, but the good thing about exploits is they don't need to be deterministically correct. It's enough to be probabilistically correct. It, because when you're running an exploit, you can do the same thing 50,000 times, and if you actually hit one of those 50,000 times, you're home free. You managed to do the thing. There's nobody who's going to complain about your code quality in your exploit. There's nobody who's going to go profiling this saying it's too slow. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> and it gives you a much wider room to operate in. But even so, though, exploit development is still programming. It's just programming of a really shitty machine. And that's my talk. Thank you.